Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, bros, welcome back to the Yo Elliot Show, otherwise known as the Elliot Host Podcast. So tongue twisting to say that damn thing. But today we're so excited because we got our first female guest. And so I would like to introduce you to Colleen Hulse. Hi. Nice to have you here, Colleen Hulse. Now, Colleen is married to Elliot Hulse, which is me. And uh, she's been married to me for 20 years. Yes. And you guys have also been together since you were teenagers. Yes, since you were 14. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. You don't see too many people have that long of a relationship these days. Um, what would you say is, uh, you know, some of the things that have kept you guys together for so long in, you know, in a world where, you know, most people are in and out transient with relationships? Well, I think um, having a really interesting partner like you helps keep things interesting and exciting. Having lots of adventures over the last 28 years has really kept things um, going <laughs> well. Um, having our children um, has kept things going well. Um, yeah. What are some of the things that you think uh, most people get wrong with relationships and why they fall apart? I think people are, they get really dissatisfied really quickly and rather trying to... Um, Rather than trying to fix things or mend them, they just kind of give up and walk away. Um, whereas I think we've had a really um, lots of experiences where we've been challenged, where we've been um, kind of put to the test. And rather than ever walk away, we really work hard to um, figure things out, to work things out together. Um, I think having God at the center of our relationship um, kind of keeps us focused. And I think that people who don't have that, they don't have something to kind of lean into and um, have as support. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. some of the things. So, you know, today there's a lot of blame, you know, finger pointing from both sides. Uh, women complain about men, men complain about women. What would you say from you know, your objective standpoint are you know, some of the errors that maybe uh, both men and women, we could, let's start with women, uh, are thinking in terms of relationship or just bad paradigms um, that are causing the failure? I think, um, first off, a lot of women, when they marry their spouse, um, going into it, they've already kind of had more of like a mother-son relationship than a husband-wife relationship. So they... Um, they try to parent their their husband. So they try to tell them what they can do, what they can't do. They nitpick. They try to give constant direction. Um, they don't let them make their own decisions. They kind of hold them back, kind of how a mom would do to her, her little son. Um, and I think that makes the man become very resentful. And it, it kind of – you use the word polarity a lot, but it really – takes any polarity out of the relationship. So rather than there being a, a man and a woman who are attracted to each other, it's like a, a mother and a son who are kind of just like bickering all the time right. because the son isn't doing what the mother wants and the mother is wanting the son to do, you know, all kind of... And you'll even hear people sometimes, you'll hear women say like, oh, it's like I have an extra child. Yeah, all the time, all the time. And, um, you know, I can't say that's the fault of the woman or the man exclusively, but I think they both kind of play into that um, the way the man shows up in the relationship um, will kind of give the woman permission to treat him that way. And the way the woman shows up in the relationship, if if the man isn't kind of, you use the word frame a lot, like if he doesn't have his own frame, she will kind of just take advantage and kind of set her own frame for the relationship. And that, yeah. that kind of, um, yeah, just sets up a bad a bad paradigm in the relationship. It's often described as dereliction and usurpation. 
So the man is a derelict in his duties. And so by default, the woman usurps mm. his That's authority. Hard. So yeah. let's talk about guys. Uh, where are men perhaps uh, dropping the ball and where women are, you know, in some cases, I, I not that I could, I understand, but I can't fault them because it's like, well, you know, the guy is a weakling. Where are guys sort of dropping the ball that making women anxious and needing to be their mommies, perhaps? Um, well, I think when the man has an expectation for the woman to go out and make as much money as he is and contribute to the household and um, kind of do all the things that the man should be doing, um, again, he's setting it up for her to be the one in charge because not only is she having to do you know everything that a woman has to do in terms of housework or raising the children, she then needs to go out and work and do the man thing, um, it, it it just puts her, she has more responsibility and therefore she has more power. So I really do, I feel like the, the person who has the most responsibility in terms of um, the relationship and and the, prote the protecting and the providing, a lot of times you see the woman is like the alpha in the relationship. She's the one that if something happens, she's going to be the one to be aggressive and um, she doesn't feel protected by him. Um, She's not being provided for by him. She's right. doing the providing in a lot of situations. So I think, I think in order for, um, you know, I'm not to say that all women should stay home and just raise their children, but I think as long as the woman feels that she is having as much responsibility in terms of providing and protecting for the family, um, the man will never take that place back in terms of being the leader in the relationship. Right. It's interesting because feminism has been positioned as something that was somehow liberating for women, but all it basically did was give them more responsibility. It's almost like, you know, in the garden, when Adam and Eve fell, we both got our just punishment, right? So, man, you'll have to work and live by the sweat of your brow. And woman, you will, your desire will be for your husband and you're going to have labor pains. And it's almost like feminism told women that, well, you're going to have labor pains. You're going to be a woman, but you're also now free to take on the curse of the man. And it's for somehow, you know, for some reason that was positioned as somehow liberating. Uh, you and I got married very young and at a very early point in our relationship, our marriage, we decided to keep you home. And that was uh, even back then, 2002, 2003, that was much more counterculture than, you know, the pendulum seems to be swinging back now. Um, how was it for you to set aside your master's degree and, you know, living in a world where maybe there were high hopes from your parents or your friends and college friends that were doing big things in the world for you to just say, okay, uh, I'm willing to let that all go and be a mom? For me, it was really easy. Um, I... Although I did get my master's degree, I was teaching, I was, you know, happy enough doing what I was doing. As soon as the opportunity presented itself for me to drop all of that and be a mom, that was a dream come true for me. Um, I had a cousin in college, you know, that um, she was a stay-at-home mom and she had dropped her law career in order to be home with her children. And that to me was just like a huge inspiration. And so when I was presented with that opportunity, I just thought that that was the most amazing thing that I could ever imagine. So, um, but you know, my college roommate, she was out in the business world and the finance world doing her thing. And um, I didn't have any, <laughs> any aspiration for that. As soon as I was able to stay home and take care of our kids, I was so happy. Now, from what I understand, at that time, Elliot really wasn't <laughs> making very much money at all. No. And uh, you, with a master's degree, you were working in Long Island Public Schools. You were making more money than him. You also had the uh, the insurance uh, policy. And so, for all intents and purposes, you were giving up uh, being the breadwinner. What allowed you to have uh, faith that, even though Elliot was making less money than you and uh, didn't have any insurance, that somehow it would all work out? I think that word faith is really what it was. It was just faith alone that um, I knew you were a hard, hard worker. Um, I knew that you came from a family of hard workers that um, figure things out. And when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And, and I knew, I knew in my heart that 
you would be able to take care of us. Um, I had no, you know, I was, of course, nervous. I was um, a little nervous, but I just had complete faith. Maybe it was blind faith, but it, I, I, I had your, I had you as who you were and what you had done that thus far. I mean, just you're an incredibly hard worker. From the time I, I met you at 13, sort of dating you at 14, you were always willing to work and do whatever you needed to do to, to make things work out. And um, that just gave me absolute faith. So you mentioned faith. And so uh, we've been through myriad of different stages in faith and mm -hmm. religions. And you know, I've been a seeker since the time we were young. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've followed my path in that way, um, every step of the way. Uh, what has that been like, you know, uh, going from just being behind when we got married, there was Christian before that and going through new age stuff and then uh, coming back full circle to a faith that you and I were both baptized into, which is the Catholic faith. Um, even that may have been a kind of a, you know, a shakeup. What, what has that journey been like? So I will best explain it as being a roller coaster, like you said it would be from the time we were young. I think when we were 16, you said, Life is going to be a roller coaster. If you want to stay with me, hop on and come along with. And um, it that has just been one one area of our life that has been a roller coaster that has um, been really exciting. I mean, I'm I'm pretty much gonna I don't want to say go along, but I I trust you, and I will go along with what you are for. And at each point in our journey what you were doing is what I think you were meant to be doing. So when we were Baha'is, I mean, that was, you know, an experience. And when we went to the Protestant churches, that was an experience. And um, I was really shocked when you started looking into like the Eastern Orthodox Church and the, um, and then eventually back to the Catholic Church. I was, I was very resistant. I was very, um, I was very shocked that that's kind of where you were going because I think both of us, we both kind of cringed at the word Jesus for a long time. And I don't want to speak for you, but I know I did. And um, it took some time. It took about, I think, two years of you being consistently going to mass and delving in deep. And, you know, you don't just do something and then um, kind of, go along with it, you dive very deep into whatever you're studying or whatever you're really into. So it took about two years of you um, really living the Catholic life and learning and kind of showing your commitment to it before I would even consider going to Mass. I mean, I think I went to Mass with you one time in those first two years, maybe even longer than two years. But you know, I when when I see your commitment to something and you show it through your actions, not just through your words, um, it makes it much easier for me to kind of open up to and follow along with. And so, um, yeah, after, after I guess, two years of, of kind of watching you go through that journey with the Catholic Church and then bringing myself to go along with you, um, it felt like home. You know, maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, but by the third or fourth time I went to Mass with you, it really felt like I was home. And, um, you know, that full circle of going back to where we were when we were baptized <laughs> as infants, right. it make, now it makes so much sense. You know, in retrospect, it, it makes sense as to why it felt like home because it's where, where I was brought into as an, as an infant. Um, and both my parents are both very anti-Catholic. Um, but for whatever reason, when they chose to baptize me as a child, just following what their families had told them to do, they they graced me, and they your parents graced you. And um, it has been since then, I guess it's been about maybe a year and a half since coming back to the church with you, it's been an incredible experience just, you know, having our, our marriage sacramentalized. That was such an incredible experience and a blessing for us to be able to carry forward in our marriage. You know, it was on our 20th anniversary. So, yep. you know, we had done pretty well without the Catholic Church for those first 20 years. But I, yeah, I just see so many, so many 
even more beautiful things for, for us, for our marriage, for our children, for our home, for our community, just having our marriage be blessed by the church. Yeah, yeah, and also our children yes. brought in. Yeah. And so uh, you said cringe before, and I know why you said that, right? There's In our culture, there has been such an anti-Christ uh, spirit and I know that it descended upon me, and then especially hatred for his church, the Catholic Church. And so there, I know that it was probably the last thing you would imagine I'd be called home to. What were some of the misconceptions or misunderstanding about both Christ and his church that um, that maybe you've been able to resolve in this time and can now see see more clearly? I can't say there was anything specifically. Um just um you know all of the sex scandals i mean growing up as a and as a teenager as a child you know just hearing about that not really understanding it not really knowing anything about it just hearing the headlines um my parents influence my mom and dad both went to catholic school and had very mm. negative experiences so kind of hearing about the you know the cruelty of the nuns and um even even your mom talks about the nuns <laughs> and um, how terrible they were um so really those those were really the only experiences i had had with the catholic church you know after being baptized and um i really didn't know much about it i just knew what the TV had told me for right. the first 40 years of my life. And um, I, I look back and I just wonder how that happened. How did I go so far to cringe at the name of Jesus like that? Yeah. I Now I can't even imagine it, but that's What that's were where some I was. of the beautiful surprises? Oh, gosh. Um, the Eucharist has been... I, I still shake every time I go up to, to take the Eucharist. I, my hands are shaking um, just knowing that we get to be in the presence of Jesus, you know, whenever we go to Mass. That, to me, I was shocked by how much how much it affected me, how much it affects me every, every time we go to church on Sundays. Um, I want to say the community the community has been, um, you know, a lot of times we've gone to different churches and different groups where they're like, they try to like, as soon as you walk in the door, they want you to like do everything and join every group. And um, the Catholics, they just leave you alone. They let you come to mass. <laughs> they let you worship. They let you receive Jesus. And, you know, there's no pressure. It's just, you know, just go and do your duty and no one's there to, to bother you or judge you. Um Really learning about um, the beauty of Mary has been mm. incredible. I, mean, I did the Bible study this past fall with um, with some of the women at church and just learning about Mary and, and how we can use her as an example, as a wife, as a mother, um, has been extremely helpful in being able to put into words how I want to live my life, how I want to be a wife, how I want to be a mother, um, how I want to support you how I want to raise our children. I mean, it, it just learning about Mary has been very instrumental in just kind of giving words to what I've always felt on the inside, but didn't really have words to describe. Yeah. That's been really It's nice to beautiful. have a spiritual mother yes. as well, right? And Jesus yeah. from the cross, uh, we learned today listening to Dr. Taylor Marshall, mm -hmm. that he only said seven things to us, and one of which was, behold your mother. And so it's beautiful that we have a spiritual mother. And you have really taken on the mantle of mother. And, you know, you you really wear that well, like you were built for this. And one of the things that um, you did, which was unique, and, you know, you, you followed my lead, <laughs> uh, was to have your children natural. Mm -hmm. No medication, no surgeries, no drugs. Uh, and in fact, three out of the four were born at home. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So, uh, you know, how your perspective and decision to be a natural birther, a mother, <laughs> birthing person, <laughs> um, differed from, you know, the mainstream culture. And what would you tell women who are, were, are willing to consider natural childbirth or home birth? 
Well, I mean, I can only compare my one birth in the hospital to the three that we had at home. And, you know, it was a, a world of difference. Um, first of all, the whole birthing process, going from being a woman to being a mother, is transformative in itself. Um, so just not to be afraid of of that change. I think so many women, they don't want to become moms because then they lose so much of themselves or, you know, that's what they think. They're going to mm. lose so much of themselves. Mm -hmm. But what you gain from it, it far supersedes anything that you lose in your womanhood hood when you become a mother. Um, so just not to be afraid of, of being a mother and not being afraid to completely embrace being a mother. You know, like like you were saying earlier, I had my master's degree, but the fact that I could then become a mother a master's degree was like garbage. There's nothing more important than being a mother for women. I mean, it it is what we were created to do. You know, we we could design rocket ships, but let the men design rocket ships. We the men can't have children. Men can't create life inside of them. And men can raise their kids, but that's not what they're designed to do. We are designed to raise our children. We are designed to be their first educators and their primary educators. Um, and when it comes to the whole birth process, I think, you know, you were always more of an all natural kind of guy and wanted to uh, have our children at home and breastfeed and co-sleep and, um, you know, as soon as, again, like as soon as I heard about that, I was like, that seems really interesting. Let's let's kind of inquire more. You're always willing to go on my weird adventures. Yeah, yeah. Well, you always have pretty good ideas. So um, sometimes it takes some warming up. I think even with, with natural birth, I mean, I think I had to read two or three books before YouTube didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. So I think I had to read some books and kind of talk to some people before I was kind of enrolled. But um Having our children naturally, I mean, besides just being the healthiest way to do it, um, it allows for so many more bonds to be created between you and your husband, between you and your newborn. Um, it really eliminates the medical establishment from having, you know, they don't even belong in the birth process, you know, unless some freak emergencies, which are much less common than they lead us to believe, there's really no reason for a doctor or a hospital to be involved in the birth process. So um, really just having a midwife who knows how to deliver babies or help the husband to deliver the baby um, and having your husband there, that's really all you need. And um, you know, all of our births were beautiful, um, but particularly our three that were at home, I mean, they were just incredible. What would you say to a woman who's nervous, afraid, scared, um, that it won't work out or the pain will be too much to bear. Um, how did you go about reconciling that fear in yourself and how do you uh, resolve the pain or dissolve the pain? Well, I'd say becoming educated, of course. Um, you know, we took birthing classes for, I don't think, 12 weeks. We did the Bradley Method birthing classes, which, you know, I think I'm more of like an intellectual, like if I can have it in my mind, then I can make it happen in my world. So for me, once I knew the facts about how much healthier it was for me and for the baby, there wasn't a choice. I wasn't going to have pain medication regardless of what happened. So for me, it was more of an intellectual thing. Um, I think for a lot of women, it is very emotional and they're scared of the pain. For me, it wasn't really being scared of the pain. It was just making a decision and going with it. Um, but for women that are scared, Man up. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you just need <laughs> to up. Tough up, toughen up. I mean, really, when you know, you know, if you know that not doing drugs is going to help you have a healthy pregnancy or drinking alcohol, you know, you don't want to drink alcohol during your pregnancy, something rational in, in you has to say, well, if doing drugs during my pregnancy is bad, it's probably bad to do them while I'm giving birth mm -hmm. too. And so just kind of reconciling that in your mind you know, pain is temporary. Pain is temporary. And it goes away as soon as the baby's born. What are some of the benefits to the mother and the baby uh, by, by doing natural childbirth as opposed to? Um, well, so uh, first of all, if you go to a hospital, they're going to want to give you all kind of um, Pitocin and Cervidil. They're going to want to give you all kind of drugs to kind of speed up the labor process. Um, when they do that, that increases the baby's heart rate 
mo- many times. And when that happens, they wind up wanting to do a C-section. It's an emergency C-section. Well, it's not. it shouldn't have been an emergency C-section. It should have been a natural childbirth that didn't have drugs introduced as soon as you got to the hospital, and it wouldn't have turned into a, an emergency situation. Um, but so just avoiding surgery because the recovery from a C-section is – weeks and weeks long. You can't you can't even barely lift your baby for all those weeks where, you know, having natural childbirth, Emerson was born on Christmas Eve and we were at your parents' house Christmas Day, walking in the door at Christmas Day. Um, just from a physical standpoint, it's, it's healthier. Um, the drugs do pass, you know, the blood-brain barrier to the baby. There's n- nothing that can contradict that. If the drugs go into your system, they get to the baby. So, I just I couldn't, in my right mind, agree to have drugs during my birth when I knew it would get to the baby. Um, the bonding, the oxytocin, I mean, the oxytocin that's produced when you actually birth naturally rather than by C-section, um, your body produces all kind of hormones that um, help you to bond with your baby in those immediate minutes after he or she is born. And... Again, one of our babies being born in a hospital, after just a few minutes of being able to hold her, she was whisked away for four hours. And then you stayed with her, but I didn't stay with her. I was away from her for four hours. It's kind of inhumane. It is very inhumane. So at home, you have your baby. The baby is given to you. You are never separated from your child. And I mean, as a new mom, I just... That was probably one of the most traumatic experiences of my life was having my child taken away from me for four hours as soon as they were born. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are just some of the... Would you say that uh, a lot of the women who are having postpartum depression could avoid this uh, if they would have had natural childbirth? Um, I mean, natural childbirth would probably help, but not cure it. I think breastfeeding will absolutely... Mm, okay, I mean, me not more. eliminate it, but it would help... Um, bring down those postpartum numbers, perhaps. Um, again, just the oxytocin that's released when you're breastfeeding your baby. Um, the bonding that goes on when you're breastfeeding your baby. Um, I mean, every from from you know from start to finish, breastfeeding allows you. It allows your body to do what it was meant to do. You know, a lot like they say, like after you have your baby, if um, if you don't breastfeed, your body thinks your baby's dead. Right. Your body thinks your baby died right. because Where's it's not that be attaching to you and starting to nurse. So your body kind of goes into a shock thinking on, on a biological level that there's no child anymore. Whereas a breastfeeding mom, you put that baby to your breast and your body is naturally starting to... Um, regulate. Um, It's been a long time since I've studied all of the effects of breastfeeding, but there are so many, um, I mean, even just in terms of like feeling, feeling yourself, I mean, the weight loss and the- Right. You've um, told me about how the uterus contracts and then makes the belly smaller. Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot of women, they have this pouch. Yep. Yep. So breastfeeding will help in those initial days and weeks after the baby's born to kind of um, contract and get back down to size and kind of bring the whole abdomen back down to size, which is great for, you know, postpartum bleeding. Um, you know, a lot of uh, when we were in the hospital and they, you know, they gave me a shot of Pitocin without me knowing it after Isabel was born. And I, I was like, if you would have just given her to me to nurse, it would have, I wouldn't have been bleeding, you know, like, right. it, being in a hospital, they kind of contradict everything that the body would naturally do in order to regulate itself after delivery. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's just so many, so many benefits to to breastfeeding. And the immunity for the child. I mean, when you breastfeed your child, any anything that they come into contact to or contact with that kind of um, a virus or a bacteria or anything that they come into contact with that they're kind of trying to fight off, their saliva enters into your breast tissue and lets your body know what kind of antibodies you need to produce in order to help the child fight it. Wow. It is, it's incredible. So, you know, benefits for the mother, benefits for the child, 
benefits for the family as a whole. I mean, being able just to go out and not have to worry about um, formula for shortage. formula or heating up water or um, getting yeah, out just, of bed at night. Yeah, it's so a lot so of easy. guys they explain to me that you know after having a baby, they take turns with their wife. They got to get up and and mm. put bottles in the microwave or whatever <laughs> at night. They're like you never had to do that, and no, my wife literally just rolled over and fed the baby. Yeah, while, yeah, while they were sleeping. Um, one more to add to that. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. I think I remember reading this, that even the facial structure of the child, their skull, uh, the muscles in the jaw and the head sort of are stimulated because there's a difference between the way they latch onto a nipple, which is sort of in a lazy way. They don't have to use the muscles of the face as opposed to opening their jaw wide to yes. latch onto a breast. Yep. So it's much more difficult for a child to get milk from the breast than it is from a bottle. So they get kind of lazy when having a bottle because it Even kind of flows. Even the sucking, like the body breathing yep. and using the muscles in the abdomen, yep. I bet. Yep. It's very, um, they've, I mean, I don't know, I don't remember the studies that showed it, but like it, it definitely changes the facial structure by, by having to breastfeed. It's, it kind of challenges the child and I don't want to say challenges, but it kind of, it does what it should do. Whereas with the bottle, it's just very, very easy. Yeah. And so you have four children. That's... We have four children. <laughs> <laughs> Stop speaking in third person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interviewing you. But uh, yeah, four children. Yeah. Uh, I was raised with four children. Uh, you know, I have three siblings. Um, today, that's considered quite a bit. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, well, homeschooling them, right? So now you got... You have four kids, and two years ago, uh, after COVID, we decided to pull them all out of school. We had them go into private school, all four of them. It was, or you know, some at a time, yeah. but it was very expensive, and uh, not all what it's cracked up to be. You know, we were getting a lot of woke stuff, even though we were paying thousands of dollars. Um, we thought that the they would be a bit more conservative, but it just turns out they had more white guilt because they're wealthy. Um, what, what has been your experience and what are your thoughts or what do you have to say to anyone who's considering uh, pulling their children out of the uh, Marxist indoctrination camps and homeschooling them <laughs> instead? Do it. Don't wait. Um, so many, many, many years ago, you had uh, wanted me to homeschool from the time the kids were little and I resisted. Um, and I, I look back and I think for me with, you know, the amount of stress of having four young children. I and mean, Isabel, Simone was born on Isabel's first day of kindergarten. So, you know, it was it was crazy. And I couldn't imagine trying to school children that young. Um, there are some women that do it beautifully and that I look at them in awe and wish I could, could, could have done that. Um, so I think that it happened for us in the right timing. Um, having uh, Benjamin was in fifth grade or fourth grade, you know, and then we had two middle schoolers and a high schooler, and um, it it happened at a perfect time for us. All right during the pandemic. During the pandemic, um, and you know they were doing the online school for those first few months, and um, they hated it. They hated the online school, and but I loved having them home, and you know I was a middle school teacher before very briefly before we got pregnant with Isabel. And they were at the age that I was like, I think I can do this. And, you know, we had talked about it. And you, again, you're always the one to kind of investigate first and kind of come up with the idea. Come up with the adventures. Yeah, come up with the adventure. And you had, you know, really loved Charlotte Mason. And so I started looking at Charlotte Mason, and it was a little too loose for me. I'm a much more structured um, type of teacher. So, you know, I just started investigating and coming up with, you know, Gather Round, which is what we use, it literally brings your whole family around the table. And that's, you know, Isabel, by the time we started using it, Isabel had just graduated um, or was about to graduate. So it was just the three younger ones. And it has brought us so close. Like I am closer with my children now than I ever could have imagined even mm -hmm. being with them as adults. I mean, they are... They're incredible little people that and I was do, missing out on. Don't they on. drive you crazy having your children home all day? No, no, they don't. I 
I thought that they would, but they don't. They're they're so incredible. And I look back on all of the years that I missed out on having them home and having them with me. And, you know, I, I don't have any regrets. I try not to have any regrets. But they're, they're little minds that were, you use the word indoctrinated. I mean, crap that they were fed in schools that we thought they were, you know, great schools. We were paying great money for these kids to go to school. I see, I see the error in, in that choice. But, you know, they got that experience. And now they really appreciate being homeschooled. You know, if they hadn't have been in school, they right. wouldn't have had anything to compare it to. So now when I say, well, I mean, you know, you guys want to go back to school? No, 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 no. We don't want to go back to school. So um, it gives them some appreciation. And what do you say to people who will argue that, well, then they don't get any socialization? Well, I mean, our kids get plenty of socialization. You know, we're part of, you know, you do trail life with Benjamin. So you're doing like, you know, boys camping, wilderness stuff. Our girls are in soccer, so they're playing soccer five, six days a week um, with a team. Um, we do homeschool meetups. We do field trips. You know, we do plenty that gets us out. And we have to. I mean, that's really what keeps it, keeps it, you know, exciting. You know, you can only sit around a table for so long or sit around the living room for so long. So I, I try to do a good job at getting them out around other kids, around other homeschoolers, um, around other adults, like going – going to mass every Sunday, just being around other people. Um, but they're definitely very socialized. Our children do not struggle with socialization at all. But I think that's up to the parent to make sure that happens. I mean, I'm sure there are homeschool kids whose parents are like hermits that don't take their kids out and just kind of stay at home. That I'm sure that can happen. But, you know, as a parent, you have to do what um, what you have to do in order to make sure they are socialized. But I want them socialized with the people I want them to learn from. I don't want them socialized with other types of people that have ideas that go completely against everything right. that we stand for. Well, the, they would say that you are non-inclusive or in, intolerant. I'm exclusive. <laughs> right. Yeah, I want to keep my kids away from people I don't um, necessarily want them influenced by. So one area that has been a great challenge, it's a new one in our world today. We didn't grow up with the internet. We didn't grow up with smartphones. Um, one of my intended adventures was to raise a home without a television. Uh, I failed. And I actually even brought screens into our home very early. How do you, what are your thoughts on how we go about trying to protect them from a lot of the indoctrination that comes into our home through the smartphones? I think we do the best we can. You know, we put filters on their phones and filters on the Wi-Fi and filters on the, on the data. Um, you know, we take their phones away at nighttime. All their devices come, come downstairs away from their bedrooms at night. Um, we talk to them a lot about topics that we know they're going to be exposed to online mm -hmm. and kind of kind of give them a heads up about what they're going to see, not not if they're going to see it, but when they see it. Um, I mean, we can't protect them from everything, but I think just kind of kind of keeping it, you know, I wish we could I could say we like had time limits, right? I mean, I'd like to eventually have time left time limits for them, but I don't think it's I don't think it's realistic. I think as long as their phones are down at bedtime and you know, during the school day they're so busy with school that they're they're not on their devices except if we're doing like research for for a class. Um, but really being honest with them about what's out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. You know, we talk to our kids about pornography and we talk to our kids about transgenderism and we talk to our kids about, you know, anything that we think that they might get exposed to. We don't shy away from those conversations. And I think that's important so that when they come across them, they kind of have a, a preconceived idea about what it is so they don't just fall into the traps. What do you think about when boundaries need to be set and children need to be corrected um, and this 
this cultural tendency to believe the child or to yield to the child's feelings um and being uh being antithesis to that being a a parent that doesn't that won't go with the flow but instead says no well i'll never be the parent that says my child would never you know there's so many parents that say my child would never do that i i will never say that I think anything that could happen, my child could possibly do it. I'm not, I try not to be yeah. ignorant of that fact. Um, I think it is, I think it's important for parents to be the parent. We are not their friends, just like we're not our husband's parent, we're not our child's friend. Um, and that to recognize that children flourish best with boundaries. I mean, everything flourishes best with boundaries. Marriages flourish best with boundaries. Gardens flourish best with boundaries. And children are no different. And to really, you know, first figure out what those boundaries are. That might be very separate for each family, different for each family. But really coming to um, a conclusion with your spouse about what those boundaries are. And then making sure you're both on the same page with not giving in to those boundaries. Because mm -hmm. I think so many times you get parents who, you know, the kid goes to one parent and asks, one parent says no, they go to the other parent, the other parent says yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something we do really well at, um, really keeping consistent with what the boundary is and maintaining it and not letting the kids cross it. Um, but I think as soon as as soon as the kids know they can cross the boundary, they will. Mm -hmm. Especially if one parent says something different than the other. Yes. Yes. And if and if you let one kid cross the boundary, then the other one's going to, you know, try to cross the boundary. So, you know, I think we've had to kind of do some catch up. You know, our oldest one, we kind of, kind of let some electronic things slide when she was um, – a little younger and now we've had to play catch up with our younger kids like no 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 we're not we're not doing those rules like that's the boundary is firm you know with like bringing devices down like we we have had to kind of go reinforce things that we we made mistakes on and i think that's important too like don't be afraid to kind of fix your mistakes don't you know the kid's going to throw a tantrum or you know i know kids that say if you don't give me that i'm going to commit suicide and it's like well you as the parent need to still set that boundary. You know, you need to deal with the child, but you need to still set the boundary. You can't just change your boundary because your kid says they're going to go, you know, commit suicide if, if, you don't, if you don't give in. It is that serious. It is that serious that your boundary, if they know they can cross that boundary, they're... By threatening you by, yeah. or trying to make you afraid mm -hmm. of what they're going to do. Yes. Yeah. You can't crumble. You can't. You can't. And, um, you know... I go to you when I feel like, okay, I'm I'm being pressured by my child for something. I go to you for support to kind of like make sure that I'm being firm in it and to give you a heads up that they're coming to you next and that you need to be firm in it because I know what's right. I know where our boundary lies, but I know that, you know, this child is about to get to you and try to get you to kind of, you know, turn away from it. Um, so I think just really working with your partner to kind of set those boundaries is and then not just set them but really uphold them uphold them and have clear you know like i remember gosh we've done this a bunch of times like just writing a whole list like a family rules list yeah and kind of revisiting that as the kids age like how do those rules change when they're 10 to when they're 14 you know the bedtimes electronic rules friend rules dress code i mean we kind of you know went down the whole list of um, you know, homework, like, you know, different things that you know that there's going to be um, contention about. And so you can always point to it and say, well, what does what does the rule say? What are the consequences for breaking the rule? So you have something clear to kind of lean back on. And then, you know, well, if they don't think it's fair anymore, okay, well, then we can have a meeting and discuss if these rules should change because you're two years older or five years older. But really, you know, just having those set is really important. What kind of uh, aspirations do you have for your children? You know, you're, uh, you have three daughters and you have a son. Um, of course, we can't map their future and we can't pressure them to be or do anything. But if you had it your, your way or if you um, saw the best outcome for them, what would that look like? 
Um, I, I would love to see my three daughters married to amazing men. I would love to see them have lots of children and give us lots of grandchildren to <laughs> love on. Um, I would love to see them find their place in the community in terms of um, service somehow, um, how they, like, you know, serving with the church or serving with, um, serving the community somehow. You know, I would love to see them homeschooling their children. Um, I know, I know that some of our children are more interested in that than others, but I, that's what I would love to see. Um, you know, having hobbies that they love and that they're interested in and that they can kind of pursue um, would be great as well. But I really would love to see them have great husbands that that they support, um, that they encourage. I'd love to. I'd love for us to be able to look at our children and who they're married to and kind of just be so thankful that they found a spouse like we have found in each other. Like right, someone I, we can make a part of the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know my mom always says, like, I look at you and Elliot, and I'm like, I'm so thankful that you found him and he found you. And I really, I want to be able to look at our girls, and, and, and a Benjamin too. I mean, I'd love to see him married with children too, but I think he'll be like an electrician or something. But um, for our daughters, I really just want to see them be mothers and love being mothers. You know, if like that's not their thing and they decide they don't want to be moms, like whatever, you know, mm -hmm. we will love them and support mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they all have hearts for, for motherhood. And I think all women have hearts for motherhood. I think it's just been kind of, you know, right. stabbed and, you know, devoured by our society. But um, I think our daughters, they see the value in family they see the value in having a husband. They see the value in um, having a home that they can that they can feel good in. Um, they see the value in just um, being a woman who loves her husband and supports him and encourages him. And that's I, I would love to see that for, for all of them. And I love Benjamin to have a good wife who does mm -hmm. <laughs> who does the same for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so we recently moved to Lake County. We were living in Pinellas County for a long time. We were city and suburban people, and we enjoyed that. That was great. Uh, we were called to the great yonder, <laughs> uh, and it it happened in a very miraculous way. It was something that was in our hearts, but never really pushed it, and it just seemed to have unfolded perfectly uh what are your thoughts about living out in a more rural part of florida and you know the acreage that we're on and you know uh, aspirations for that or where do you see that going um well i love it i'm really happy to be away from the city um i didn't really realize how much i didn't love the city until we moved away you know i'm always kind of happy wherever we are so i kind of just mm -hmm. um I'm always grateful for, for where we are and what we have. Um, but being out where we are now, I love it so much more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, our home is beautiful and our having the acreage is, is great. Um, I, I don't know how, how it's going to unfold. <laughs> <laughs> we have your parents coming mm -hmm. um, to live with us in their little, little house in the back. So that is going to be huge. Huge for us. Um, in just and terms how of, do you get along with Elliot's parents? Oh, I love them. I love them. Mm -hmm. I love them like they're my own. Um, I'm very excited that they're going to be coming to to stay with us. I've heard his dad's kind of crazy. His dad is definitely crazy. Um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to be nice to have some help around around the place. I mean, you work so hard that it'll be good to have some extra hands um, to kind of help out. But, you know, I, I do see lots of livestock. I do see chickens coming. I mm -hmm. do see um, oh, if we can get rid of the gators. <laughs> mm. That'd be good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where it's going to go from here. But I know I love having the space. I know I love having no neighbors. Um, I love having just open open space and 
peace and quiet and darkness. The, it gets very dark at night. I love that. I love that it's actually dark where we live. Um, yeah, I see, you know, hopefully one day the kids maybe will want to build their own little houses on the property, you know, once they find their spouses and if they want to stay close, have the grandkids, you know, in our backyard, far in the corner. But um, yeah, possibly that. It sounds like you have a uh, storybook life, right? Some people could be listening to this right now and maybe even rolling their eyes saying, oh, it can't be all that perfect. Tell us, uh, so what are some of the challenges, if any, and so how do you resolve them? Like, does Elliot ever get under your skin or, you know, w w tell us a little about the bad stuff. I don't really have much bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, the leak in the bedroom. <laughs> Did it leak last night? No, but that damn leak in the bedroom. We've been trying to get our roof fixed for, we don't know if it's the roof or the window. We've been dealing with that for a year and a half. They keep fixing it. That's a pain in the neck. Um, I don't have much to complain about. I mean, driving driving to church is a pain in the neck. It's far. It's really far to drive to church. <laughs> but it's the perfect amount of time to listen to uh, Bishop a, Barron yeah. say the rosary. Yeah, it is. But it's far. Um, what else? What would you say to uh, wives, mothers who maybe are struggling, um, what advice would you give them about how to keep peace in their home or to live a life uh, that is as problem-free as yours? Well, I'd, I'd start with your husband. Um, really find out ways to be with your husband that allows for the most ease of communication, the most ease of um, attitude, you know, going into life in a in a heart of service to your partner is, um, I'd say, a great way to start. Um, looking at your partner and finding out how can I serve them, um, and that goes both ways. Mm -hmm. um, really, just finding out what can I do to make this person's life easier, better, more enjoyable. Um, Asking questions, you know, really just communicating with your spouse about really how to make your life better. You know, what can I do to to provide for you or to to give of myself to you? Um, and then when you're able to do that, you will hopefully invite them to do the same back to you. And when you live in a in a home where the parents are constantly um, serving one another everything just flows well because you know my first priority isn't myself it's how do i make you happy you know like and being able to make you happy makes me happy mm -hmm. and when the kids see us doing that it makes them happy and you know and then being a service to our children and i'm i'm not saying don't take care of yourself like i think i take very good care of myself mm -hmm. my needs my wants what I kind work of things out. do you do to take care of yourself well i mean i Go to the gym and I Because there'll be people that think that uh, maybe, you know, you're oppressed or you don't get anything for yourself and you give yourself away to Elliot and the kids and, you know, there's this, this sense that maybe uh, you've given yourself up. What do you do to care for yourself? Well, I think it's a balance. I think it's a balance of taking care of your family, but you can't give from an empty cup. So... For me, I love I love working out. I do yoga. I go to the gym. I work out at home. You know, I I spend lots of time exercising because I know I am a better wife and a better mother when I do that. Um, I go to Bible study. For me, that is so filling. That is so filling. I when I come back from Bible study, I'm so inspired and I'm so encouraged, and um, it's super helpful for me. Um, being involved with other moms, you know, I have yet to find a really good group of moms where we live now, but you know, online, I have some moms that I'm friends with and just really staying connected and getting ideas and, um, kind of learning about homeschooling. And I love, I have, I read, but audible, um, really just enc encouragement and, um, 
finding out how I love finding out how I can do, do better at what I do. Like that's I really enjoy that. Um, cooking, like for me, I love cooking. You know, people might say you're oppressed because you you know you love being in because you, you're in the kitchen all the time. But I actually love being in the kitchen. Um, I I try to look at all of my tasks that I do on a daily basis as like I do them out of love. Even when I wash the dishes, like I I wash the dishes and I could be grumpy, but I try to wash the dishes dishes with a smile on my face. Like I I really try to um, do everything I do in in a in a happy way, and that that is filling for me. And you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to some people, but serving other people is filling for me. So like I do take care of myself. I go out for coffee and read my book by myself sometimes or, you know, just driving by myself sometimes is like a little mini vacation. But um, really, I love I love serving my family. And it is – it's more filling than it is emptying. I mean, but you got to have the right person to do that for. You know, if you weren't – if you weren't grateful and if you weren't reciprocating, it probably wouldn't be as wonderful – and if our kids were bratty and misbehaving and, and ungrateful, it wouldn't be as fulfilling. But when you find someone who's who's on that same journey with you, it is um, it's it's just easy, you know. It, I want to say life is easy, but life is easy. It's like get on the same page with the person you love and make it make it happen. I mean, it's it's not rocket science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, one of the things uh, that I didn't know I appreciated, but I do in retrospect, is that you're not all over social media doing selfies and making motivational videos. Like you, could, you leave that to me. And so, and I see guys, you know, their wives are out there teaching and stuff like that. Um, but there are, are those, and I've got lots of requests um, who want to hear more from you. A lot of women want to hear more from you. I'm sure a lot of guys who follow me are going to share this with their wives or their girlfriends or whatever. Um, now, you do have one social media that you allow to be your public face. Do you want to share that? I think it's just Colleen Hulse on Instagram. Yeah. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I just share really just family stuff, what we're doing what workouts we're doing or what we're cooking for dinner or yeah, birthdays. Yeah, just a window into yeah, the just, family. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I want to say, because I feel it's on my heart to say that I'm only as good a wife as you are a husband. Um, and I don't think, I know this wouldn't work if you weren't who you were in my mirror. Mm-hmm. I want to cry. Um you provide so much. You do so much. You you offer so much that it really makes it so easy for me to offer my whole self to you. And I love that about you. I love that you're always willing to go the extra mile and think about us first all the time. And it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure being your wife. Yeah. I do everything I do because I want to give the world to you. Yeah. Yeah. So you tell me that often. <laughs> yep, I want to give you everything. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been fun. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Yeah. yeah. What'd you think? You enjoyed yourself talking? You yeah. think you were a little nervous, yeah. but you do well. Yeah. It takes yeah. me a little time to warm up. <laughs> yeah. Well, once you get rolling, you're great. Yeah. Yeah. You're built for it. So that's it. That's all. That's our show for today guys we'll be back with another show sometime here soon uh but now i'm going to take my wife and we got our children out in the lobby and we're going to go do some christmas stuff yes right she booked some uh lights lights. christmas light spectacular christmas light show and we're gonna go have dinner we're gonna have a great time yeah and so that's it i love you i love you